So I'm going to move away from uh, Germany and Europe and and sort of the the developed world into a uh, an area that most of us have never been to, and that's the Democratic Republic of Congo, which we can question the word democratic part of it. Um, but the Congo is a, is a massive country in Central Africa. And one of the interesting things from a mining perspective is that there's, it's actually home to the Copper Belt. And the Copper Belt is sort of this area down in, in Central, down in the south here, it sort of extends from Zambezi and, and, into, and into the Congo, which is essentially an area where this plate sort of shoved a whole bunch of stuff up onto another plate and then left a whole bunch of little great big giant rocks of copper. And as over time, they've sort of eroded away, and, and we're left with what's called the, the Copper Belt, which is dozens of copper mines all across northern Zambia and southern Congo. And we're working in one of the big copper mines down there. Uh, it's a relatively new mine. It's been operating since 2009. And uh, one of the issues here is just that it is actually a really complex geology. It is, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's basically a bunch of giant rocks full of copper that are sitting on top of other rocks that, uh, and then trying to sort of make heads or tails of all the geology is just a real issue. And I guess one of the other issues is the fact that we've got um, a, a layer of really porous rocks sort of associated with the copper mineralization. And so what we have is we have some of the wettest mines in the world. Um, literally, really, really wet. And, and the cost of dewatering is actually one of the largest costs that actually controls whether or not the mine will be profitable or not. And the other interesting thing is that what we're actually dealing with here is, is we're mining the hills. So basically, there's these big hills, and they have a seam of of really high-grade copper down the middle of them with almost vertical layers, and then basically you're coming along afterwards and then removing the hill. And we have, at this particular copper mine, now there's been mining of copper here for, for hundreds of years, mostly as artisanal mining, and, uh, but it's a relatively new mine, so we basically have no or very little historical data. And typical minings, we have um, lots of information at the mine and almost nothing outside of the mine. And so we have, and you can, almost, you can sort of see that in the picture in the background there, where you've got these sort of areas where there's lots of detail, and then outside of that, it's just basically guesswork. And one of the problems with the artisan mining is that it's actually, this area is just covered in people. And there's thousands of people actually living on the concession. And so when they shut down the mine at night, you know, the mine fills up with people all digging with pits and shovels. And then you see in the morning, they're going out with a, back, with a bag of rocks over their shoulder you know, to sell them in the local marketplace. And, and so we've really got, so there's a whole range of sort of social, environmental, and, um, and uh, technical issues about mining in, in this part of the world. And, which is the main reason why we've actually had to deal with not just dewatering, but also hydrology. And so what, in terms of hydrology, we've actually got something that looks like, um, you know, we've got a, a hydrology model where we're trying to sort of link the mine into the, into the hydrology, into the surface water hydrology. And because really what we're looking at is, from a hydrology point of view, we're trying to look at this from a sort of a more holistic manner and looking at sort of the water balance and trying to understand that the, the water, from a water management point of view, what's actually happening to the water on the mine, on the concession and in the catchment. And to do that, we need topography, we need surface water catchment information, we need uh, vegetation information, um, soils distributions. And ultimately, what we really want from a hydrology model is something like that, like, an infra, like a, a map of distributed recharge over time, or what we might expect based on, on the information that we have. So we might have high groundwater recharge areas in the waste rock piles. We might have uh, groundwater discharge along streams and along sort of areas of, low of topography um, controlling features. And from that, then what we've built in, in this particular mine site, we've built a, a Mike Shee model 
which is um, about almost a thousand square kilometers. It's basically three catchments. And the reason it's three catchments is because the mine is actually sitting right up on the catchment divide. Again, it's a hills. And, and so the mines are actually just mostly in this catchment here in the center with the mine, a lot of the mines sort of sitting along on this side and then all the infrastructure in the, in the upper catchment. And so we sort of have to model all of that together. You know, but again, you know, we've got this catchment of a thousand square kilometers and basically the only information we have on groundwater levels is within just that mine catchment and around the mines themselves. And all of these bores have only been put there in the last two to three years. So we, and, and some, most of them actually only in the last year or so. So we don't really have a whole lot of information from historical point of views. Um, we also have a, a, a scattering of information associated with stream, stream flows. And, you know, we're trying to use the Mike Shee model to actually calibrate against those stream flows. Now, because stream flow is actually a, a good aggregator, an, an aggregate of the, the flux in the system. So we've got recharge, and all that recharge is essentially discharging into the streams or being lost by ET. And what would we want? What, what kind of questions can we answer with the hydrology model? And one of the things that they did number, when they first started building this mine is they, they built these big stormwater dams. And they didn't really think too much about it. And up in the, in the top of the picture, you can see the waste rock piles from, from one of the mining areas. And they built this, this stormwater dam. And that's, that's an aerial photo at the end of 2014, which is the end of the, end of the wet season. And, and it was actually a very dry wet season. And you can see how much water is in there. And, and in fact, um, at the end of August, so this is only, th what's that, three months later? I mean, the place is almost empty again. And, and so what we really have is we have a very seasonal water system where it rains for about three or four months, and rains 1,200 millimeters in three months or four months, and then it's dry for the rest of the year. And, uh, and so that really about controlling stormwater and how do we actually manage that stormwater? Well, that was one of the questions that came up. And, and so one of the things we had to calibrate was against pond levels. Well, and actually what we've used here is a, is a groundwater level just behind the dam. And you can see the, the line there is the, is the ground surface at that. So what we're, we're looking at is when the groundwater level is above the dam or above the surface, then we have ponded water. Now, one of the interesting questions that came up was, well, where do we discharge all this water that we're going we're to take out of the system? And we're looking at 1,000 cubic meters an hour. And, and in, in two years, that dam will be filled up. And they hadn't really realized, but that actually the dam will fill almost all the way back to the, stock, the waste rock pile. And if you put in 1,000 cubic meters an hour for two years, it will fill the whole way back, or nearly the whole way back. And then most of the dewatering water that, that they have to pump out is actually coming from infiltration from that pond. And so that's obviously not sustainable. So then the next question is, is well, where do we get rid of the water? Because we've got 1,000 cubic meters of water an hour we have to get rid of. And, and then all these questions about, well, what's going to happen to the streams? Is it going to cause flooding? It's all, you know, there's sort of a whole lot of social issues associated with that discharge. So that's some of the issues that we have to deal with in, in terms of the hydrology. Now, we also have a dewatering model, or a set of dewatering models, because we're actually wanting to dewater the pits. And we're bringing in, we have local FIFALU models of the mineralized areas, and we're building geologic surfaces from the mine site mine planning model. And so the mine planners are using mine site to actually decide, well, well which areas do we mine first, and what are the ore grades that we're going to you know, collect out of those, and how much money can we make? And so we're taking those, that information then and pulling that into, into fee flow, and then we're bringing the recharge and the lateral boundary conditions from Mike Shee for the groundwater model. And, and actually, you can see that's one of the mine pit areas. That's one of the mine, um, mine phases in, in, the, in the background there. And again, we have these challenges associated with the, high, with the, with the groundwater model, and that is that we've got very porous rock. Um, we have very significant faulting and folding. We have nearly vertical layers, and we need a very detailed gel or detailed FIFO model because of the geomechanics. And the geomechanics is important because they're looking at slope stability. You know, what is the slopes? If they can make the slopes a bit more steep, a little bit steeper, then they can save a lot of money in, in terms of um, uh, stripping ratios. 
And in terms of the Mike Xi, we're going to use Mike Xi for actually calculating, taking the recharge from Mike Xi and then adding that as a surface boundary condition into fee flow. Um, right now, we're using a static one-way coupling, but we are sort of working on and trying to develop a, a two-way coupling that, um, so that we can actually do a more dynamic coupling here. Now, how does the fee flow model look? We have to, um, in, in this particular model, we've actually, it was an, um, an older, bon older model and it was actually uh, more constrained than what we might normally have made. Um, but the, the green areas then are the different mine phases. We have, in those mine phases, we have a lot of detail, the geology, and again, outside of that area, we don't have very much. And, you know, we have very nearly vertical layers and very complex geology associated with that. And we're basically mining by taking off that hill. And the fee flow model looks something like that. So we have to have all those benches in there, because if we don't have the benches in there, then we can't simulate the geomechanics for the slopes. And then it looks something like that. Now that's when it says pre-mining state, that's actually today. And then if we start going into the future, we start seeing things start to dig out as the, as the mine progresses over the next three to four years. And interestingly, that because this is actually a, um, you know, these are small mineralized areas, the mining does only last for three to four years. And then they move on to the next little mineralized hill and take that away. And, well, what kind of things can we actually get out of this? And one of the, one of the questions then that we wanted to actually look at here was uh, things like um, the evolution of the life of mine and the pumping rates. So in this case, we can see, you know, we, around, that mineral, around that one mining area, we have, I think it's like eight pumping wells. And that were put in, basically the geomechanics guy came along and said, oh yeah, well, let's put a well here, well here, well here, and well here, without actually thinking about it in terms of the geology. And so they've got eight dewatering wells that aren't necessarily in the right positions from an optimum dewatering point of view. And, but then now that we actually start to look at this in more detail, we realize that, well, actually, we need to pull out a certain amount of water and we to lower those water levels below the bottom of the pit or keep them below the bottom of the pit as the mine progresses deeper and deeper. And in this case, we look at the red bar there is actually what needs to be pumped to meet the target, which is on the, the bottom, the target water level, which is 15 meters below the bottom of the pit, the progressive bottom of the pit. Because what they're doing is they're drilling holes into the bottom of the pit and then they're putting in explosives and blasting it. And if they, if they have to use, if they don't want to blast in water. Um, the dynamite doesn't like it and if they, if they use, if they have to blast when it's wet like that, then they have to use a much more expensive explosive. About four times more money to do the explosives. And so they're really concerned about keeping that bottom of the pit, not just the bottom of the pit dry, but at least 15 or 20 meters below the bottom of the pit, or the, cur um, the current bottom of the pit. And so if we wanted to just sit there today and say, okay, well, we actually want to get down to that level, the red, bo the red bars of what we actually need to pump, and the green bars is what we physically can pump in terms of if we pumped all eight wells full out. And what we can see is that the achievable water targets aren't going to be met. So we can't meet then those um, target water levels. We can't physically meet them simply because the wells are in the wrong locations. So that helps us then to sort of say, okay, well, where do we need to put in more wells? How many more wells do we need to pump? You know, what kinds of, you know, can we actually install bigger pumps in these wells or can we deepen the wells and, 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 and meet those requirements? So there's a whole range of questions that we can ask if we want to start looking at using the model for actually optimizing the placement of dewatering wells. So wrapping up, basically we have a regional hydrology, hydrology model built with Mike Shi, and we have a detailed groundwater flow model with FIFO for this particular mining area, and we're building out more and more and more of these models in all the different areas. And for that model, then we're taking the lateral boundary conditions from Mike Shi, and, and, and primarily the recharge boundary for the distributed recharge boundary from Mike Shi. Um, but, you know, this is an ongoing project. It's an ongoing, it's been going for a couple of years now, and it, it'll probably, I mean, there's probably enough copper there to, for me to retire on. Um, 
And so what do we need to do? I mean, what are the, some of the things that we're actually working on next? Well, first of all, is that we're trying to, um, the first step now is what we're doing is we're moving all these models back over to the client. I mean, the client, there's a, a, a couple of guys sitting there now and they want to know, well, what if we pump here? What if we pump there? What if we deepen this well? You know, so the models are built and we need to transfer that to the local staff so they can actually start running their scenarios themselves while we work on the next mining area. Again, it's a new mining area, so there's actually a lot of data issues. Um, we're just in the progress right now of collecting LiDAR data for the whole concession, um, which they've never done. And up till now, we've basically just a patchwork of satellite images and different, all kinds of different data sources for the, for the topography. Um, they flew geophysics a few years ago and then didn't bother to analyze it. So actually, we're going back and reanalyzing all the geophysics for the regional hydro, hydrogeology now. And there's a whole process of installing data loggers in, in both surface water and groundwater systems. Now, the loggers is one issue though, and that comes back to the African issue, is the fact that we put a logger in the ground and the next day it's stolen. And so there's really a lot of issues with security and all these sorts of things too that we have to worry about with working in Africa. The Mike, current Mike Shee model is the whole thousand square kilometers of 200 meter grid spacing, which is too coarse for a lot of the questions that we actually want to look at. So we're in the process of building sort of smaller um, local or catchment models, sub-catchment models for each of the individual catchment areas. And that we can then use for more sort of infrastructure planning or flooding or river diversions and that sort of thing. And, and on the fee flow side, we're actually building, linking up all the different mining areas into, into sort of super mic fee flow models with, that are refined just around the mineralized area and much coarser outside of the mineralized area. And then and then ultimately, we're, we're actually starting to work with John and, and, and we're doing a lot more work with Alex in terms of the uh, feed pest analysis and trying to evaluate the uncertainty of some of those pumping issues and that sort of thing. And that's where I want to stop.